coming to the Office of Research for this uh, presentation by Jan Worth Nelson. Uh, Jan has conducted a study of swords and uh, was wanting to share with us um, her experience with clickers and her help with uh, faculty members and the experience with students. And I think she gave a presentation recently at a national conference on this topic. Uh, we funded her uh, to help uh, the Office of Research funded her, and uh, so we are very happy to do that. Uh, let me just um, share a little bit about Jan. She has two master's degrees, which many of you already know. Uh, one in uh, social work from Ann Arbor, UM Ann Arbor, and the other is in fine arts and creative writing from Warren Wilson College. I think many of us know Jan not only from her directorship at the Thompson Center, but her um, uh, status as a faculty member uh, teaching classes and teaching classes in creative writing um, in the English department. And um, Jan also spends time in Los Angeles as well as here where her husband has a business. So she's, she is a little bit of a jet setter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And, and I'm just kind of. He looks like one. <laughs> yes. And uh, hey, come on in. We do have some pizza out there. Okay, so, you. Yes. So um, it's very nice of you to come in and uh, support uh, our presentation and to support Jan in our office. So, Jan, I'm going to turn it over to you. And uh, all, hopefully, all of you have seen this poster, which we. Uh, Center around campus, and it's a nice poster of Jan and her project on clickers. And uh, one other thing I should uh, remind the folks who have come in just now is to be sure to get a clicker. Thank you. Yes. yes. All right. Well, thank you, Jan. Well, thank you. So, uh, you, many, you all know me, so I don't really have to explain myself here, but I think uh, what's, what has been interesting for me about this project is um, as a creative writing person as a creative writing teacher, um, I had never, this is not the kind of thing that I would normally have engaged in. So, uh, so there are several aspects of this project that I think were gratifying and interesting to me and possibly uh, of interest to you all. And that was that um, it was a really great learning experience for me to go through the steps involved in a semi-formal, I guess it would be considered a formal research project. Um, I found it very intellectually satisfying and stimulating, and I felt like I was learning some new ways of thinking. Um, and another aspect of this project that I wanted to note was that, um, in some ways, the, 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 best, the best findings of this process for me, for the TCLT, and I think for the other participants, was how it felt to be part of an inter interdisciplinary team. Uh, we asked, a fascinating question, you know, in, uh, in Ken, Ken Bain's work, he talks a lot about fascinating questions and how that can motivate our students. And I think in this case, we, ought, we came up with a question that was interesting and fascinating to us. So um, it, w it really felt good to, to, to be engaged in that sort of thing. Now, um, our project has changed a little bit since we started. Um, uh, in fact, we're not even using this type of clicker anymore, uh, and that's, that was somewhat of an outcome of our first year because we had so many frustrations with this particular company and this, this tool. So, um, but I wanted to just have you see exactly what, how we did it for our first year when we had the funding from the research office. So uh, we presented our results at the Bethesda Lilly Conference on Teaching in June, and uh, these people here uh, went, and, it was fun. We had our, our presentation was on Friday afternoon, and we rightly uh, thought that no one would show up. So I went out and bought a bunch of wine and tried to spread the word as fast as possible that there was going to be wine there. And I, that yielded us only a few extra people, but one of them was Mel uh, Cox, who is sort of the granddaddy of the Lily Conferences, and he has communicated with us several times since the presentation, and he connected me with Derek Ruff, who's a national clickers uh, expert. And, uh, and then I um, also, somebody wrote a blog about, about my, my uh, extrapolation into another project. So, 
So um, I can't, I don't have any wine for you, but I do appreciate that the research office uh, um, provided pizza. And uh, also, the, the interesting thing about wine, I, I might throw this in, is that supposedly one, one drink improves motor performance. After that, it goes downhill. <laughs> so sometimes I think, you know, liquors. Yeah, yeah, it's a rather precipitous one. So uh, I sometimes think with the awkwardness that comes with clickers, maybe we should all have a quick shot of something before we started out here, including me. But I'm, I'm coming to you sober. Uh, so you can see the other people who were involved in our project um, were uh, Roy Barnes from Sociology, who I thought was going to show up at some point, um, Aaron Caviskill from SOM. Uh, John Collins was uh, involved in the project as a technical support, and Nick Timmerman was our DSRA last year who uh, participated and did some of our literature searches for us and everything. Uh, you all know Carson, you know Sandy, I think, back here, everybody knows Sandy. And this is Jen, uh, who is our current <laughs> DSRA. I'm oh, sorry, what is, I forgot Jen's last name. And it's Jennifer Ross. Jennifer Ross. Ross. Okay. I should say That's Jennifer Ross. <laughs> Okay, um, we called ourselves the Clickers Click. It's just the poet in me just wanted alliteration as much as possible. So what, what I'm going to talk about today uh, in brief is an introduction to the whole thing, a background in history on this, um, our methodology, our guiding pedagogies, and that's an important point to me about Clickers because as with many other kinds of additives to a class, um, this is, a Clicker is not a pedagogy. Clicker is a tool. So how you use it is going to be defined by your own pedagogy. And I think that's a point that's often overlooked with some of these sort of things that are, you know, attached onto our teaching. Uh, and then I'll offer some conclusions and, um, of course, mandatory fun <laughs> with clickers. I wanted you to try them out. And you'll probably, by the time we're done, you'll probably see why we switched. Um, Okay, so um, why are you holding a, a clicker? I'm not asking you to answer. I'm not giving you an option to how to answer right now, but uh, basically it's because I want you to see what the students did in the class, uh, classes that where we use these. Um, okay, but now this is a question. So at this point, if you would hold down the on-off button until you see a Q6 come up on your little screen, then it should say ready. Uh, it's right in the top left-hand corner. Okay. It says enter responses. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. So now it's ready for the question. It's ready. Okay, good. So uh, I'd like you to quickly pick which of these possible answers applies to you. Now, uh, this is a new update on Quizdom that shows me who's, uh, you, you, everybody here who has a clicker. And if I, if I knew what your number was and I could go, Taysir, I see that you haven't clicked on <laughs> I have a question. Okay, sure. So, is it like a cell phone where at ABC I have to hit it twice to use the B? Uh, no, you can use the arrows. Just, just use the arrows, oh. yeah. Oh. Yeah, and so you use the arrows. Once you get it over, yeah. you can just hit send. Whatever answer you want. I think so. Send sound number eight. Oh, yeah. 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 So the options are, you never touched one, you've used them as an audience member but not as a teacher, you've used them occasionally as a teacher, or you make them a regular part of your classes. So this presentation, when we did it at Lily, all those people that are there are teachers, so, um, and, and um, most of the work that we've been doing, since this is a research project that involved classroom uses, and I'm wanting to know how people feel about it as teachers to the extent possible. So let's see what we got here. So here's one of the advantages and also one of the irritations with Quizdom particularly. Um, so if you're using clickers in the classroom, you have the option of immediate feedback for both you and the students. I have this set up where there's no right answer. Um, you can set it up where the students immediately see red or green, whether they've hit the right or the wrong answer. In my use, I used it almost exclusively where there was no right or wrong answer. I didn't want the students to know right off the bat whether they had the right or wrong answer because I used it as a discussion starter lots of times. So if, if they know that they got the right answer or the right away, then sometimes their motivation to discuss with you will be a little less. Um, so we've got 
and also, what, what's irritating about wisdom is it's hard to, like, the, this thing comes up and it covers up your <laughs> options, so it's really irritating. Right. <laughs> so, um, the new system that we have, iClickers, is much more user friendly, so I'm just showing you. Uh, all right, so three people in here have never touched one, so how's it going so far? <laughs> so far, so good. with your extra Well, it's back there. Oh, yeah. Okay, seven of you are have used them as an audience member, not a teacher. That's interesting. So there's no one in here who's used them as a teacher. That's well, you're a good audience for today's um, presentation. Then. All right. Um, now, I'd like to ask you, which of the best describes your affective experience or, and or level of interest about clickers in the classroom? So, I gave you a bunch of options. This is, one could say this is a bad clickers question because it's so complicated that you have to really think about it, but some people would say that's a sign of a good clickers question too, because we don't want you to make superficial responses. You don't want your students to be thinking that clicker questions are just busy work. They should be used, in my idea, as, a, a, an, as an aid to critical thinking. So, um, uh, here are your five options. Pick the one that best describes you about clickers. Uninterested, bored, or, and or opposed. Somewhat interested, but with reservations. Curious and positive, but inexperienced. Know a lot, tried them, but concept with pros. Generally pleased to reinforce my rewarding results and want to hear about others. And Raleigh, who just came in, has, has joined us on this year's project. So we'll, we'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. All right, so 10 of 11 have found an answer that suits them. Is there one other person that didn't click in yet? <laughs> now, if it were a classroom, I have tended to wait until everybody has clicked in. And um, that is very difficult for me to do because I'm one of those people that always struggles with my wait time on questions. It's also an advantage for me as a clicker's user, as a teacher, but um, it means that the students are given more time to consider it. I mean, it allows for some so a variety of response time by the students. So you have to kind of, I think every teacher, and depending on what, how you're using the clickers, has to decide if they want to um, so then could people change their answers? Uh, not on this system, the way I have it set up, but on the iClickers you can, it's really easy. And, and that why you wait. Yes, you know. why you, yeah. Uh, and then you can, they can also change them with iClickers even after the results mm -hmm. come up, which can serve you and can also not serve you. Right. Depends. Uh, but, but what's interesting is the system keeps all of that action. Mm -hmm. It stores all of that action for you, so you can study what has happened with your use of the clickers afterwards. Okay, so let's see what we've got here. Well, we've got one somewhat interested, but with reservations, and in the discussion time, I hope we can hear from you about that. Uh, one person is generally pleased and reinforced, but the bulk of you are curious and positive and inexperienced. So, again, that's probably why you're here. <laughs> And again, you know, if the if the teacher gets this immediate feedback, and it's and if you're asking content questions, and the students all are getting it wrong, or many of them are getting it wrong, I really love the element that there's immediate feedback for the teacher, because the teacher can say, okay, so let's go back to the drawing board here a little bit and go over this concept. So you get immediate feedback on that, and I think that's that is very helpful because. The traditional way of going about it is you just plow through your content, however much that is, and um, we may never know that the students didn't get certain parts of it. Yeah. Or you say, you got it, and then they say, yeah, yeah, right, got it. Or the, I, I've often said, is that clear? So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And of course the students are going to say yes. Right. It's just you, you dilute yourself in, yeah. in the nonverbal feedback that you get. But this allows for some anonymous feedback that can be more honest. Okay. So, um, you can put your clickers down for the time being. Um, right now, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the background of our project. Um, so, there had been a kind of clickers initiative about eight years ago, I think it was. And uh, people bought these, this was this company, people, there, was, there were a group of about, I think, six or eight faculty, some in nursing, physics, 
um, engineering, physical therapy, chemistry. physical therapy, what? Chemistry. Chemistry, yes, thank you. Um, and when I came on board the TCLT, we received in our first round of TCLT grants after I came on board the TCLT in 10-11, uh, we received a couple of requests for clickers. And my thinking was if the TCLT is going to support it, first of all, we should build in something that tells us whether this is a good idea. Um, and, we, and we should make sure that it's well organized so that the proper tech support was there. Because what I heard was from the first time around, the tech support kind of dissipated and people had trouble and they didn't get help. And so it was not a successful iteration. I think what happened was certain people just independently kept using them if they could figure it out. Uh, but they didn't communicate back to the institution at all. And again, the TCLT, in my view, should be a place where we pay attention to what we're doing and try to learn from it together so that we can share it. So that's a key element. And that's why this research project uh, came into being. Plus, I was just kind of curious. Like, I wanted to try a research project myself. I had never actually gone through the, the ritual, the protocols up here. And I felt like since I was talking to faculty about stuff like that all the time, I needed to. So um, Mary really helped me. I was very appreciative of going through these steps. Um, and I learned a lot from it, and I felt more confident. So even a poet can learn how to do these things. Yeah. Let me just add, Mary is our specialist in IRB, which is human subjects research. So if it's a focus group or a survey, um, one needs to contact her. Right. And you were great, Mary. So thank you. I really enjoyed that process. Um, okay. So what did we do? Apparently, we're going to see. So we funded our project using several sources. Um, the Office of Research came through for us. Uh, we got a, a supplemental amount of money from the Academic Assessment Committee because I was making the point that this was about paying attention to the results of something that the institution was investing in. Um, the Technology Fee Committee gave us some money to buy our clickers. And then we used some, TC, some of our TCLT endowment funds. And that where that came in handy was that we were able to actually pay um, the two tech support people, a stipend for being available to our uh, clickers people. And that was great. Uh, and these were the five classes that we originally included. Um, a marketing class, my creative nonfiction class a year ago, um, Greg Lubarczyk's intro to spatial analysis, a med surge class in nursing, and a social class. So you can see, this was really pleasing to me because we've got somebody from SOM, we've got um, uh, CAS, uh, and then we've got um, 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 SHIPS mm -hmm. participant. The only one we didn't have was education. So this is very pleasing. Um, and it really helped us to see how <coughs> pedagogical and disciplinary realities would affect how you would use this tool. We had some really interesting conversations on yeah, I could see uh, number five, sociology with statistics that uh -huh. cut across many disciplines. Yeah, and then Roy ended up helping us with our data and so on. Um, and he was the most content-oriented, I think, on his use of the clickers. So our hypothesis was my hypothesis. It was a TCLT question, that a Jan Ward Nelson question, which was, I was theorizing that students would retain content better on questions posed by the clickers than questions posed in the traditional manner. The traditional manner being, Laura, what's two plus two? Four. Okay, great. What's three plus three? Anybody? Three. Thank you. Okay, that's how it usually happens. It's a Ferris Bueller approach, you know. You ask the question, and you One wait for the answer. answer. Whoever whoever the smarty pants is in the front row always puts up their hand. Yeah, yeah, me, me, me. Uh, and that's the extent of it. And we, we consider that active learning in some quarters. Just that. But my theory is that's probably not enough. And it certainly doesn't engage everybody. Right. So I was going to say, hey, I could make it. This would help me make the case to faculty for some kinds of active learning if I could show that using clickers actually helps students retain content. So what we did was we posed two sets of questions, one set requiring clickers and the other posed in the traditional way. So this is a burden on the teacher. The teacher had to keep track of two sets of questions all the way through the semester. Uh, and then several times during the semester we gave quizzes. I thought it was funny that we ended up using a scan chart. Um, 
when they were messing around with a little technology stuff. But that was the best way for it to work since we were posing the questions in the traditional manner, too. Um, we didn't want to use the clickers to do the testing, right? Um, and we combined the questions and we compared the results. And our tech support team, Carson and John, went to all five of our classes and observed. And then our click met four times in the semester. This was in the fall a year ago. So I want to talk about the pedagogical rationale. Um, this is a big, if you know me and you know my work in the TCLT, this is a big deal to me. Like, I just don't, I want people to be intentional in what they're doing in their classes. So, uh, in a way, as I said at the, at the beginning here, sorry about this, this is a central part of clicker, this system that is irritating. I don't know how to get rid of it. I had an automatic update here, so let me see. Our, our hypothesis became an institutional excuse for exploring a whole realm of intriguing ideas about um, interdisciplinary collaboration. Greg Rubarczyk, who came in, was one of our four presenters at the end of it. So I hope that you will contribute your thinking. I did take out all your slides. <laughs> uh, as well as the much valued student engagement, it drew us into deeper thinking about our practices, uh, course design, and institutional implementations. And we had some old friends to help us and some common sense premises as guide. I found this part very uh, rewarding. We gave ourselves permission to mess up, observe, meander, and question. Um, in that sense, this was not a crisp, clean research project. It wasn't perfect. It would never pass muster in certain arenas. Um, but for us, it was about partly our learning as much as, as the students' learning. And I feel that that was a great thing, actually. Um, we did not care about hierarchy. We were collectively curious. We wanted to have sophisticated fun while perhaps finding out some new things. And it felt that way to me. So, who is that avuncular smiling man on the last slide? Now, now you turn on your clicker, it should, if it went off, you should wait for the Q6 to come up and then it should say ready and then it should go right to the question. Okay, five of you have already Yes, indeed. Just like pigeons. <laughs> it, I'm glad you said pigeons instead of rats, because people always say, oh, he's a rat guy. But he was mostly a pigeon guy. Well, that's and, what? That's his famous book. Yes, that's what he was famous for, yeah. Thank you. And um, in the presentation I just did at the, another Lily about B.F. Skinner, which is very fun. Um, Them. Okay, so it is B.F. Skinner. Oh, I know what, what I told what I told him there was the whole internet, as far as I'm concerned, is just a massive Skinnerian experiment that is yielding amazing kind of reflection on his original ideas. And in fact, uh, since I've been at the TCLT, I dug his book out of the library. I told you about this, Laura. It was last checked out in 1998. Uh, his book, The Technology of Teaching, and he, there's a chapter in it called uh, Why Teachers Fail which I found remarkably relevant to my work even all, and he had written the book in 1968. So he was, in this book, he was talking about early program learning machines. Uh, it was really interesting, so maybe I can do another presentation on that. Sure. Um, but there are Skinnerian elements to clickers. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to show you your results. And this is, you know what, I, on this system, I think I go back. I think, yeah, I don't think I'll show it. I know. So maybe yeah. I was going to yeah. ask you if Rich could answer that question. I'd say probably. <laughs> with a, could you hand him a question? Okay. So, how many people said Skinner? Okay. Anybody that did? Who? Anybody pick someone else? Who did you pick? Oh, he's yeah, good for you. He kind of looks like Spock, doesn't he? Well, I thought it was funny that Ch I put Chomsky on there because if you know the history of Skinner, he and Noam Chomsky got into this huge conversation that went over years. And Noam Chomsky thought Skinner was like the devil. And um, I don't agree. I actually should have truthfully said I don't have a clue, but I've heard you recently talking yes. about Skinner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, when I was when I when I got my MSW, I uh, 
my, my major in Ann Arbor was behavioral counseling, and at the time, in the 80s, in the program in Ann Arbor, um, there were a number of sort of Skinnerians, one really pure Skinnerian, then a couple of other sort of softer behaviorist types, and I, I was really, I really, uh, the common sense of many of the theories that went with it were very appealing to me. So I've always sort of felt that Skinner was one of my intellectual mentors. Um, we also, uh, uh, and the TCLT has been passing this book out a lot, we found John Medina's book very helpful, um, Brain Rules. And in particular, these are five points that we thought, thought were relevant to this project, which was that, first of all, we know from the neurology that we don't pay attention to boring things. The way Skinner would put it is, if it's not reinforcing to you, you're not interested. And I know some people find that morally repugnant, but it's based on observation of behavior. And, it, and again, it all depends on what you mean by reinforcement, blah, blah, blah. But, but the way that uh, John Medina puts it is we don't pay attention to boring things. I think it's hard for teachers to accept that when they're staring out at 30 or 40 students and the student's eyes are glazing over and the teacher hates the students. <laughs> but it's neurology. Uh, and it's part of what makes us human beings because we are really drawn to what we're curious about. Uh, repeat to remember, remember to repeat. Again, this is based in Medina's book on neurological evidence of what the brain retains and doesn't. So I thought that would support my hypothesis that if you use the clicker, it's a way of repeating and remembering that it seemed to fit in with the neurology. That's emerging. Um, the neurology is saying that you will learn better if you stimulate more of the senses. So the fact that you're holding the clicker, that you have to look from it to that, you have to actually do something. Uh, there's a combination of the visual clue, the auditory clue. So you're hitting three or four of the senses there. I couldn't figure out how to work smell into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That it affects the brain. And then uh, I love this one too, that we are powerful and natural explorers. And that's what felt great to me about my faculty participation in this, is that it was fun that we were trying something new or at least for us. So, that's kind of what I'm saying there. I put, I, I just always put the Korean friendship bell here. It's one of my favorite places in San Pedro, and it's a place I go to renew myself and inspire myself. And, and I think a friend of mine told me that there's ionization in the air. Maybe chemists, you can tell me. Somebody <laughs> said that the reason people like to be on the beach is that there's some kind of ionization that goes. There's so you actually, mm -hmm. there you go. Same thing. I'm glad you're here <laughs> to tell me that. So I always put that there because again, that's a place I go to sort of get my brain, you know, ready for life. And it's nice. Okay, um, and uh, we've already covered some of this. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this part here, but this is kind of the crux of what we're talking about. That. If you, Derek Ruff is a person who's done a lot of writing about clickers, a lot of research on it. So you get instant formative feedback. TCLT is really big on formative feedback. We want teachers to be very good at that. It's like Ken Bain said when he was here. Um, try, fail, get feedback, try again. Try, fail, get feedback, try again. Or try, succeed, get feedback, and try again. Because you can learn as much sometimes from what you do right. I think that's something writing teachers are always trying to incorporate. We can help our students see what they're doing successfully in their writing. And that I've learned over time that's a very powerful kind of feedback, too. Um, they allow for everyone in the room to participate. Very powerful. Um, so you can't just let the smart person be the one that answers all the time. Some students find them enjoyable and entertaining. My creative writing students do not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they provide a moment of silence for both teacher and student. I'd like to write a whole paper just on this part. But, it shuts the teacher up. We don't stop often enough. And I'm a one, as you can tell. I just, I just love to keep filling up that silence. It's an issue in my creative writing too. Yeah. I haven't learned about the white space. You're a poet. I'm a you poet. Know what I, yeah, exactly. I know, and I, I, I'm, I'm still learning. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in process on that. All right. So after all that, here's our results. Okay, so interestingly, of these classes, we ended up with only four. One of our participants dropped out, the nursing person. Uh, only creative writing class where the students detested the clickers. Uh, 
did we get a signif significantly statistic difference. But as Roy pointed out, Roy Barnes, the others were close, except for Greg's. <laughs> and Greg, who I think carried out the research project the most accurately and the most purely, I mean, you really, you really were crisp and clean in how you did it. He saw a slight mm -hmm. decrease uh, away from our hypothesis. Um, but the sample was small. The sample was small, so you can see our ends here. Uh, we had a total of we had a total of 99. And like in my creative writing class, there were all, well, there were there were I had a, I had a wait a minute, no, no, that's the questions. That's number. Is that the number? That's the number of questions. People. No, that's the number. That's the end. Yeah. So I mean, these were pretty small groups. That actually. Uh, but yeah, so Greg had a few ameliorating pieces of feedback for us. Like he said, your your N was small. Um, there were we did not we we were like we we didn't control really cleanly and crisply. Uh, people may have been introducing the questions differently from class to class. Um, he, Greg was all PowerPoint oriented, where in my case, when I posed the questions, um, I didn't pose the uh, the non clicker questions. I didn't pose the answers on the screen. So you know there were lots of differences that we could point to. But we did get data. Um, the, and then the course that triggered our fondest implementation hopes proved to be our most challenging. Um, and that taught us several important lessons. Um, she just really had trouble with the technology of it. And um, also, she was using a Mac. This system is horrible with the Mac. So she was going to have to redo all her PowerPoints and put them into some other weird thing. And, uh, she also had a very large, she had a, the largest class, I think, and her students were crabby about it, and so we understood. Okay, so some conclusions, reflections, and recommendations. This is my beloved backyard Buddha and my spring silla. Do you know these little blue flowers are so beautiful? You seem to be not having any trouble in the back. <laughs> what? You seem to not have trouble with the back. Oh, no, 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 I, I like that. But, but see, I had not done this before, so I didn't have an existing stack of PowerPoint questions so you to, to redo. Yeah, so the iClickers that we move to now is much better. You can use it with Mac or um, you know, PC, no problem. So we're hoping that we can lure that nursing person back into this system. I don't know, she was kind of, she had PTSD about it, and I understand. <laughs> um, so what obstacles do you see to use the clickers in the classroom before we go into our concluding discussion of questions here. Um, I have some, obviously I have some bullet points for, it for us too, but I thought I'd start with you. And this Cost to students. You can pick more than one answer. Oh yeah, on this one, pick answer as many as applies. So you, you, what you do is you, you click on the little square box that you see, and then hit the middle button, and then you can Turn click another button. one. So okay, you, yeah. does that make sense? Okay, so do you see as an obstacle a cost to students, that the prep time is too great, and I'd like to talk about that, um, that there might not be enough technical support, fear of public humiliation as a teacher, uh, not convinced it aids learning, or it doesn't suit my discipline. Or anything. Has everybody answered who's going to? This is another thing that's kind of awkward. We got it shows you every different combination. On, yeah. So it's a little bit, and iClickers is actually better in their in their display too. So let's just take a look at what we've got here. We have one, two people who said A, the cost to students or cost institution. Uh, clickers are about as much as a textbook. If you have the students buy them, uh, the iClickers are about 39, 40 bucks. These Quizdom ones were considered sort of the Cadillac of their line, and they were 50? Yeah. 50 each. So that is, if the institution buys them, that's, that adds up. Um, okay. Let's see here. What else we have? Three people said A. Three people said A. Oh, three people said A. Because, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we've got a couple people said B. Three people said B. Prep time too great. 
Uh, that is a consideration. I would say to you, active learning strategies in general in the classroom require work. You can't just, you know, I mean, I was, I was telling people, again, the story I told them many times. I signed up for a class here a few years ago. Just, I was working here, and I walked into the classroom. The teacher came in, I knew the person, opened up a kind of a shabby, loose leaf notebook, and delivered a lecture for an hour and 15 minutes, closed his notebook, and left. And that's what he did every day, and I'm sure those were the same lectures he had been doing for 30 years. He's gone now. Not that I mean gone to heaven. He's <laughs> not here. And I, um, that's not what everything is telling us is the best way to be a teacher, the best way for your students to learn. It just, it's just you're deluding yourself. Um, so, but I acknowledge that it takes more work to go in there each day, <coughs> respond to where your students are, how they're doing with the material. Yeah. I heard an objection that was interesting, and I haven't come up with a, a way to counter it yet. Someone said that, that there is like an implied contract between the traditional lecture format and the student. So that students that come to class and they hear from the teacher, oh, well, there's these flipped assignments I want you to do. I want you to watch this video when you're not in class. Right. Uh -huh. I heard someone say that the objection will be that the students will feel like they're being cheated somehow. Right. I didn't quite understand. I heard that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then some, some, some people will say, um, well, it's not my job. My job is to go and deliver the content. It's the student's job to get it however they get it. I've heard that quite a bit. But um, with something like that, the students come to class expecting to a lecture. Fed, to, expecting to be yeah, fed. and yes. they go, well, if they didn't have to come. And part of it is because, like in the computer science area, we don't have like live online, so you can watch the class after, but you can't really participate if you're not there. Yeah, so I know. I, it's a well, little you can guess so where, weird. I, where I come down. Yeah. <laughs> um, not enough technical support. We were lucky. I mean, Carson and John have just been fabulous for us all the way through. Um, but you know, because I'm not a technically skilled person. Um, um, it really mattered to me that if I ran into any kind of snag, person was always just like right there. And, and do that come up often? Uh, just at the beginning, mostly. I mean, I think the troubles that the nursing person had were the most upsetting because she just couldn't get that to work. The the, the interface between the Mac and the questions. So uh, usually it's just at the beginning, and it's like a lot of anything new that it's front loaded. Yet at the beginning is we had a training on campus, and then. I was out in LA at the time, so I ran myself through their little, you know, thing. I, I kind of learned most of it, but then you know, we had connections with Quizdom. I have to say, despite all our objections to Quizdom, that help person, our connection at Quizdom was really great too. But, and then, like with Greg's case, has this Keith a lab manager? Like Keith ended up, he was interested in it, so he came in. So Greg really kind of had his own yeah. tech support just because of that situation. But tech support is crucial. Yeah, it totally is. Because if you can't get it to work. I think, uh, well, it leads you to number D. Like, I've had, I had that incident with the group this year. I went into my class this year, and there's only seven students, and I wasn't sure I was going to use it and everything. But, and I, I wasn't as familiar with iClickers as I had been with Wisdom. And the first day or two of class, Carson was up there with me, and we couldn't get to work right. And the students were like, ah, why do we have these? I hate these. And um, so I just finally said, Failed experiment. This is the last you will see of clickers in this class. Okay, we're glad. Uh, not convincing aids learning. Well, you can see our data. We did not get the really wonderful support for my hypothesis that we hoped we would. Um, and I will tell you that most of the national data about clickers shows. The advantage of clickers in the classroom is that the students like the class more if clickers are used there. So you get an effect in terms of student evaluations. I'm not seeing really dynamic data that says that students actually learn more. But in this case, I can't really say that you should not use them because of our data because it was messy, except for Greg. He was very scientific about it. And so um, if you look at the neurology, if you look at all, uh, everything says that this should increase content retention. So, and as, and as Roy pointed out, it, ours was in the right direction. So, 
uh, you know, B.F. Skinner would say the organism is always right, so if you don't get the results you want, you gotta go back and look at the organism. And the organism teaches you what you're supposed to learn. So, in a sense, we have to pay attention to our classes, our students, the context. Um, <coughs> The other thing is it doesn't suit my discipline. Many people feel that way. I really didn't think that this worked so well in my class, the, the creative nonfiction class. It's workshop-based. I used it for readings. I used it to kind of quiz them on the readings that I have to do outside of class. Um, then I ended up using it for rating rough drafts, and that's another story, because that was outside of our, our experiment, um, our, our study. That actually worked quite well, and I did a presentation on that at a conference uh, in November. So, we experienced some other positive outcomes, though. Um, I used the ratings feature um, that was available, and that was a very interesting experiment, and I liked it in the creative writing class. We did, what we did was, I, uh, we would show an anon anonymously a rough draft on the projector, and then um, I would have the students respond on clicker questions to how they, they would rate on criteria that had been established for the assignment. And then we would have a discussion about it. But so that allowed people to respond anonymously. And it also meant everybody in the room was looking at the essay and everybody in the room was, was giving some feedback about it instead of the usual talkative people. In creative writing classes, there's often people, you know, when you do a workshop, it would be like two people just have like a million things to say. And it's like, thank you, but shut up. So you're here for something else. Yeah. A little more diplomatic. Um, we became experts in this limitations and we moved to iClicker, so we were able to make an institutional recommendation based on data and, and our experience. That was, hallelujah, that's how things should be working in the institution, right? This was a small project, but it was very satisfying. We proposed something, we carried it, we implemented it, we paid attention to our results, and we came up with a recommendation of how things could be changed, and that's what we're doing. Our findings were enough, we thought, to justify second year funding. I didn't come back to you, though, this time, did I? This year, I don't think I did. No. So I didn't write you a check this year. You did not write me a check, <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for last year. Uh, because we wanted to be smaller scale, and also several of the faculty that were involved decided they had their students buy clickers, and the TCL team was able to buy the base, um, the little base thing. So we didn't, we didn't really feel a need for it, so to the same degree. Mm -hmm. Uh, and because I, find, I learned how to do it, um, I've offered the clickers for several other institutional uses, like the, uh, the notorious CAS um, uh, discussion of the department chair report, the chair's task force. It was, that was interesting. Um, and uh, I used it for new faculty orientation. I've, I've gone to a lot of conferences in, in which I've used the clickers. <coughs> Um, students had a lot to say about clickers. We added a question to our evaluations last fall. Um, here's a couple of the positive ones. So some said that it increased their attention span, added a little entertainment. That's what we want. Some said they wasted time and was not a benefit. <laughs> Uh, Jim, did this event come from the course email? Yeah. Is that right? These were comments from so the course So they added a uh, question yeah, to yeah. the standardized CAS course email. Right, we did. Um, we added a narrative, one of the comment ones when they wrote. Um, and I love this second one. I only liked the questions because it gave me an idea of what kind of questions going to be asked on the test, so I paid attention to that. It's like, great, that's a good use. That was a success. Um, what's behind this unmarked and unattended door? <laughs> this, is, this is, I think, your next to the last question. Did you guys hear that the 
uh, Ontario Broom used to be a bar. Remember, yes. you remember, Rich? Sure. The brewery was yeah. called, a, you could go down there and get a beer <coughs> and listen to music on a Friday night. Now you can't even say beer on campus. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I said beer. Wash your mouth That's what I heard. Mean. Uh, root beer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes, painfully, um, this is one of the difficulties. If you're going to bring in new tools, you need to think about whether we have the support that we need. So um, that was a big issue for us, and, and we actually contracted independently. We, we, we outsourced it to Carson and John, you could say. I mean, obviously they're, they're high tech, pe they're tech, tech people, but... Um, but then they even had to negotiate with Mediated Classroom Services on what would happen, which who would do what. I mean, it yeah. was very political and how we had to pull it off. Yeah, and we all know about that. When I presented this at other, you know, at conferences, that one really gets everybody to like, yep, that's how it is <laughs> on our campus too. We have, it's just difficult. But a lot of these tools are just simply not going to work. So, um, if you don't have this, the right kinds of support, and it seems to me, it makes sense if you're starting something new, to go through all your thinking uh, in advance. Okay, so I have three, three sets of recommendations. First, we already talked about support system. Please, in this case, get cross-platform compatibility. Prepare your presentation early. Practice to become familiar with the technology. I mean, I had a problem with Oh, uh, I was looking to let you finish, but I had I had a couple of questions right. for you. Okay. All right. Well, let me zip through my recommendations then, and I will have, be happy to send this to you. Do an assessment. Bring in support units. Make terms of participation clear. Make it possible to make mistakes. Use what you learned. Share your results, as I'm doing here. <coughs> the teaching. Uh, we've already talked about I think this stuff. So. Um, I would say that writing good questions and uh, mining for follow-up discussion mm -hmm. is absolutely crucial. So my last clicker questions are, um, if I could quickly do this, because they're my assessment questions, is has today's presentation affected your view of clickers? How has it? standpoint, what effects, if any, has this presentation had on you? Made no effect one or the other made me more likely to consider an interdisciplinary collaboration, made me less likely to consider. Mm. Use what you can control to affect what you can't. What distinguishes our intellect from animals is not that we can go against our environment, but rather that we can purposefully shape our environment to shape our behavior in ways we choose. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, here's my question in utilizing the tool. Were your uh, questions uh, in the classes, your evaluation of the questions, were they more like simple questions or were they more complex questions? Like, I could see this tool really helping somebody to have to spend the time to think through a question. And with complex questions, the more times that you answer them, even if they have variations to them, uh, the, usually the better it is. So that's why, that's why I was just wondering on the complexity of the questions. And then there would be follow-ups to that. Number one is how complex questions are. Number two is when you have complex questions, it probably means more prep time. Right. And then number three would be it would mean more time in class to give the students a chance to answer it. Maybe there's more silent time. 
all the all the research findings suggest that the complex questions are the ones that work best for learning. And that, yeah, now that would be in my hypothesis. And it takes a lot of work. Yeah. So um, I would say that at the beginning, I probably was using more of the simple ones just because sure. I was struggling to learn the technology. So oh, right, yeah. It's like it, at the beginning, for me, it was all I could do to just get some questions ready. Yeah. But it also, but, you didn't normally work that way. And I didn't know. Was different. Right, of like, course. But, but Roy, his were all applications. So they had to understand one concept in order to apply what they knew to a question. So I know Roy's were a lot about application and understanding. And yeah. Greg, yours, you had some complex critical thinking questions, too. Yeah, with the Quizdom, I had short answer type questions where they put in a couple words through these these devices, but it came really time consuming because you had to push it three times to get the I. So I just went to multiple choice and true false, and I even use those types of questions um, right now using the I colors. So I just keep it simple, and then I just use them as, the questions as talking points, essentially. So again, the, the form, forming of the questions really does take thought. Otherwise, it's just a toy. It's superficial, and then it and then it falls in that category that you know critics will say, "Oh, active learning is just a bunch of busy work," you know, and, and it shouldn't be. If that's all it is for you, then this is not right for you. So, and the discussion and the talking points, I think, is great. It's, yeah, Rich. Well, I, I'm sorry I came in late, but Ann Arbor held me up. So oh. they, they've been doing that for years. Jeez. Um, any case. Ann Arbor. First, true-false questions are notoriously unreliable. I never use one, never have used one, never will use one. And secondly, multiple choice ones are very suspect because all it takes is a single word to change the meaning of it. But my real question is, I'm a big fan of, do you want to be a millionaire? Okay, one of the lifelines is you get to have the audience answer the question. But the thing I don't understand is how they can get those bars to go up and down, and it just fascinates you. My dog sits there hypnotized. Your dog's hypnotized. By cool. the bars going up. <laughs> but you can't, you can't do that here. Once you yeah. cut it off, it's frozen. No, well, right? in this system, but in iClickers, you can see it going up and down. You can do and that? Then, yeah. How come you didn't? Because this, system system is a, <clears throat> this, is, this is a clunky system. Oh, oh, you mean with another system? Yeah. yeah. I, I thought you said yeah. this system. So, yeah, but you can but, do that. And there's a whole literature that comes with that, too. Like, how are students affected by how they see other people answering? And that's what happens. So, yeah. To drive yeah, I that. went to a presentation on that uh, mm -hmm. in Chicago a while back. And the guy, his whole thing was how you should pace it so mm -hmm. that you decide. Do you want it to be a peer review thing? So what, he, what this guy was doing, he'd have students answer individually. They see everybody's results. Then they come back together and work as a group, three people. And then they do the click in again, and he, and he keeps track of how their, how their answers change in peer change. review. So his, his, his presentation was on peer review. Mm -hmm. I don't know who raised that. Right. I, I just noticed that for the people who use the clicker, it's a great thing that you make your students all the time during lecture alert. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, no nap time or <laughs> anything like that because they care about the point. So especially if you set your clicker question for a point, right. and even I remember one day we set it like if you got the correct mm -hmm. answer, mm -hmm. full credit. If you got wrong answer, partial credit. For participation. Which right. means they, they want to be all the time alert to answer or to use the clicker. Great point. So uh, I found that it's a good idea to help the students be alert yes. during the lecture. It's right, and I mean, even aside from any content retention issue, mm -hmm. I think that's a good one. Because they can't learn if they're not with you. Right. So, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, and we didn't talk about grade systems, but you know, a lot of these, like iClickers, Quizum, they all have these elaborate ways that you can build in points. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, iClicker can be uh, put right into Blackboard. So, are you using the Blackboard interface? Mm -hmm. But it can be done, and Carson knows how to do it. <laughs> Steph? Um, so, so I had a comment, two yeah. quick questions that I hope, and, and um, 
The first quick question, though, had to do with um, if, if there's any research already existed on the size of class that this works best for. Yeah. So, so it doesn't matter what the discipline is, but I was wondering if, if any of those sort of clickers experts had had found a range in which. Um, I would say the whole history of clickers has been giant classes. You know, I think it started with like big physics classes. The original clickers people were physics teachers, and um, and they were people that had like 300 person lectures. And so that's what that's what propelled the early years of clickers. Um, now it's being investigated in various ways. If you look at it as a teaching tool, uh, as a participation tool, an interactive tool. So um, most of the most of the people that I know, like at the last Lilly conference, people were talking about using with you know classes as small as 20 to 30, depending on how you use it. But it's how you use it. And you know, I I just realized like in my creative nonfiction class. I would love to continue doing data for the project, but the seven people sitting there, I can make them participate. There's no sure, idea, right. you know, yeah. so. so I would say it has tended to work in its most raw state with the giant classes, but um, now people are examining the neurological data and the, you know, the, the kinesi what do you say, the kinesi kinesiology mm -hmm. of it. So there are arguments for having anybody do it in any size class for those reasons. And so then the other quick question had to do with um, needed classroom services on our campus. I mean, you know, you can order a cart of laptops. I mean, there's all kinds of interesting mm -hmm. stuff you can order. I mean, can you can you get a set? Do they ship around a set of they don't have to. And, I mean, would they consider that kind of thing? I mean, is that is that possibly a fruitful venture? Yeah, just for it would make like sense. Like sometimes, like sometimes carts of laptops have been genius. Really, and, and have really made a lot of interesting changes in what you can and can't do. Right. You know, so that you're like the department doesn't have to own it, students don't have to buy it, but yet in a moment when the whole group needs to be right. sitting there with a laptop, we can have it. And, I, and I'm just wondering, I mean, because they deliver all kinds of things, digital yeah. recorders. I mean, there's all kinds of bizarre stuff they deliver. I'm wondering if if the university would consider that type of investment. Right. Um, and if For whatever reason, they were real uninterested in our project, um, and I think they just saw it as just, oh god, this is going to be more work for us, um, and so they didn't want to support it originally. Um, we may do, but originally I had grandiose thoughts that the TCLT would be the place that would deliver them to you, and I was imagining, you know, somebody like poor Jen Ross or somebody would be <laughs> turning around these black, you know, things, like, oh, I have to get over to the white building because <laughs> deliver 30 of these. Um, I think Take it makes sense, so here's a couple of arguments yeah. away from it. First, the technology keeps changing so fast. In fact, I am suspecting clickers are going to be out of date pretty soon because phones are getting, yeah. you know, you can do phones. Students just do it on their Right, and, yeah. and so well, there are... I mean, it's it's also a technology version of something we used to do in elementary school, where you put your head down and you raise your hand. <laughs> right, right. Like there's, yeah. the, you know, there there are other ways of, of doing that very same yeah. thing. But I mean, the laptops get out of date too. I'm they, just they do, curious yeah. no, like, I, about, I do like the idea. about you know if if they would be willing to have that because in a way, you know, when they drop off those laptop cards, they're not standing around to right. do technical support in that sense. Mm -hmm. Like they're really just delivering and hoping that you take the best advantage you can of technology, assuming it's. Assuming it's on, right? You know what I mean? Assuming that the, the laptops are working, and I, I wondered if for, for people who felt somewhat comfortable with the clickers, that mm -hmm. that would be a way to. No, I, we had actually things. done it a couple of times. Like Carson just took three of her, yeah, 30 of them over, 50 of them mm -hmm. over to SOM uh, for their faculty mm -hmm. retreat. Um, but yeah, that makes sense. You, if you commit yourself to a certain tool, then you should set it up to make it user friendly. And that's why the first, right. set, the first thing went awry. Ours has gone better, but it has felt a little more disorganized this year. And, and I will just, uh, just the one comment that I was going to make. I mean, I, I, I love the interdisciplinary nature of the, the project you're working on. Um, I, I will say, though, that, that I've always found sort of your side project and the question that that side project was asking yeah. much more interesting than the content retention yeah. question. Yeah. And, and this is why. I mean, I, you know, as, as a teacher, I definitely want to know that my students are retaining content. So it's not that I'm not interested in that type of thing. Right. But I think I'm kind of more interested in, from that classroom management perspective, when we are thinking about, OK, why are they coming to class, right. to be thinking about how do you create 
how do you generate the most useful discussion you can in the room? And I think that your slide project with where students started rating drafts and whatnot, I think it, for you, and, and as we've talked about it, it shifted what you ended up talking about in the class, right? Because it meant, it made it very clear that, oh, everybody's already in agreement with this. We don't even need to talk about that. We can focus over here. And that suddenly, some sort of deeper and more interesting work happened. And that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with retention right. of the content, but it definitely had something to do with learning. But yeah. it was learning that was generated by a shift in the classroom management on the spot, in the right. moment, based on the type of feedback. And to me, that's the, that is the fascinating yeah. um, I love that question. When I found that part, I thought, OK, I'm at home with this whole thing now. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. It fit with my disciplinary interests and my disciplinary needs in the classroom. And that whole bugaboo about getting students to discuss, right. especially the quiet ones. And, and also, how you get students to say something might be interpreted as negative. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I'm rockies. I'm rockies, <laughs> This is my list of references, the, some of the literature that we used in our thinking about it, if you're interested. So, I wanted to say um, that it might be further research to use clickers or not in the same class presented sequentially, although then you get different students, okay? But I'm talking about <laughs> the problem with asking different questions, the tradi uh, mm -hmm. you know, right, there was a set of questions mm -hmm. that were the traditional way and a set of questions. Right. And then if you presented the whole class with clickers and then later the whole class, and I'm suggesting library presentations for this. I think that'd be great for you to use for library presentations. I do too, because that's such a hard thing, right. and you only get them that one time. Right, no, I think this would be a great application yeah. for you. And I also need them for a lot of committee meeting because we okay. need some anonymous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that really helps. <laughs> it really does help. That's why the CAS thing, DJ asked When everybody me. just goes along with the director, right? Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, so I'll okay. try to check them out from you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming up here on your lunch hour and for your great questions. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. All right. Thank you.